I just share with you something that Ranbir, as you all know, is a wonderful artist, much sought after the world over. I've been after him, although he's a student of Chandigarh College of Art. I have had the opportunity of uh, sharing some very, very important moments with him when I was far too young, just passed out of College of Art. He is the one responsible for initiating me into drinking beer. He was shooting for his series of paintings uh, and he asked me to photograph some of the dhabawala, some of the kettles, some of the people picking their noses or you know, sitting and then we would share uh, you know, Nirmavalma stories. I would read it out for him on the terrace of my Chinese landlord. So our association goes long back uh, into uh, early 80s. Another thing which is very important about Ranbir Kaleka is that he, after having passed out from College of Art Chandigarh, he started teaching in, in a college in Patiala, then he moved to Delhi, where he was very seriously involved with theatre workers, with filmmakers, with uh, musicians, with dancers, and he is a very consummate artist who reads a lot of literature. He's probably the best read you know, artist uh, in the Indian context. And he has taken very serious interest in filmmaking and film watching. In fact, in Patiala, in his house, there used to be regular film shows when we were still students. His younger brother also used to indulge in that. We have a common friend, an elderly gentleman called Hardalji Singh Lali. He is a walking encyclopedia of art, culture, you know, whatever you talk about on earth. He has never written a word, but if you are with him, he can walk you through the streets of Jalandhar, Patiala, Bombay, you know, Chandigarh, anywhere, and not let you sleep maybe for a few days and few nights. He can continuously talk about art, about culture, about various other aspects of life. We have shared uh, in a kind of, I, I don't know whether he's his guru or not, he certainly is my guru. And with him, we have shared a lot of things. Then he moved to London. I had the opportunity of uh, staying with him. He and his wife, Rashmi, they both looked after me for about a week. Now he's here with us with a very, very special in a video installation when he projects the images which he has very carefully you know, produced through the video or through the film medium onto the paintings and you would be happy to know that this is the first time these works are being shown anywhere in the world. Uh, my presentation with some of very early work, uh, well, work which I did not too far away from here in the College of Art. Uh, this uh, should be, I think, in my final year, uh, so that will be 1975 when I, when I did this painting. So I thought there would be some students here this evening from the college, so I would uh, show my journey to them from where I started and how some of the interests have remained the same, but how I evolved the language. and. Uh, two pieces which are outside, which are projections on paintings. So just also to, uh, so one can make sense of where that work is coming from. So that work is not, so that work has evolved. It's not, that's not happened uh, suddenly. Uh, so for that, I thought it would be necessary to show my early work going back to the very first paintings which I did. And that was here uh, in this city. Uh, this, this, in this painting, uh, there are, uh, I was away from home. I had gone to Pune for a longish period of time. Well, Chandigarh and Patiala seemed like the same place because they're not too far from each other. But that was the first time I was away from home for too long. And I missed home. In fact, the home I missed was the home of my childhood. And, uh, and how I missed it was I was at, at a uh, railway platform and then I saw these push carts and I could smell some food and pickles and so on and that's when I was reminded of home. So I painted this push cart and put a granny like figure inside. That's not a portrait of my grandmother uh, but it is to represent my grandmother. Then put a stove in there and uh, an old door. Uh, it has some scratches made by the cat on it and uh, then some old bottles my grandfather used to 
love a good drink. And uh, then there were some dark rooms uh, there where my brother and I imagined all kinds of creatures. Uh, and when we moved to town for our schooling, uh, we missed those friendly ghosts. So uh, I've written boo on the, on the vest. And then there is a winding key on the, on the knee of this, this creature. And uh, but what I wanted to talk about is that there was aspect of the cinematic uh, in my earlier work as well. There was this uh, staging of an event. Um, and something which I have continued to do is uh, when I've made a work of art, I've said that this is not a chunk of reality which I've taken from the street from elsewhere and placed it. It is an invention and it remains uh, an artifact. So yes, yeah, so it's the staging of an event, it's the theatricality. And it's also, it's, so some, which also means theatricality, also means a kind of artificiality, by which it is that uh, you put people in certain configurations to make meaning. And that meaning making uh, device way is an invention of the mind. So I wanted that to make uh, uh, obvious in, in, in all my works. Uh, this was another painting I did which was uh, soon after finishing college. I called it Adam's Ills. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, there is, there's a man at a public urinal and he's transparent and it's also inside a transparent cube. And uh, on the other side, there are some sheepish looking men that we can see. Uh, and then there are these uh, surveillance devices. So another thing also which did interest me as to where does meaning lie? Meaning lies in a kind of a gray space. Uh, art happens in a, in a space where, where, where there's no def definiteness of one thing or the other but only potentialities. So, so that area is of ambiguity. And, and that, that continues to be there in my work. Yeah, this was a drawing, again, done uh, soon after finishing uh, art college here. Uh, there's a man who uh, is bent over a spinning top. He's, he's in a protect, protective gesture, man wearing uh, a turban. Now, this figure has appeared again and again, and some of my characters reappear uh, in work, sometimes even 15 years later. Uh, the, here, again, it's a, it's a kind of staging in the sense you are viewing something uh, through cutouts, and the cutout, the middle cutout is like, a, like an eye, and there's a stylized uh, eyebrow on the top, this was a lithograph. Uh, there, there is uh, uh, there, there is uh, this distorted man who has a lot of ugliness around him. Uh, this is called hula hoop. So he's playing with a hula hoop, while further away we see a little girl who probably might be underage. She looks pregnant, and in the foreground. There are these stones which also look like, look like swaddled babies. And uh, then there's ominous sky outside the window. Uh, there's another example of theatricality uh, and mirrors. Mirrors and reflections also appear a lot in my work. This was a, this was a tiny painting. Uh, the inner painted area is about three inches. Uh, again, the, this is a painting done much later. It's called uh, The Conjurer or Man Making Fire, I think, something to this effect. So it's also the idea of how art itself is an artifact of making meaning, but it's also about the uh, of illusions and delusions. Uh, there is a man who seems to be making fire on the palm of his hand, but we see that the fire is painted. It's painted on a piece of cloth which is held up by his assistant. We can see a bit of his hand on top. Mm -hmm. 
this is again called promise of escape. Uh, again, the, the, the conjurer has a sheet of cloth on his back, and it looks like water. And see, and there is a painted boat behind him. It's called uh, Fish Dreaming of Its Holy Captors. These are all quite large. They're about uh, uh, eight feet, nine feet uh, paintings. Uh, I had traveled to Italy at the time, and you can see uh, the influence uh, in the work. This is called Bequests of Golden Scent and Sorrow. I think this was also the time around the, uh, the Blue Star operation uh, when army entered the Golden Temple. Uh, here's a man who is carrying a horse around his neck and uh, it's a mutilated horse. We see just the back of the horse. A woman steps from the shore to prop the horse's head up and uh, there's a child uh, who seems to be sitting in a circle of fire holding on to a boat which is filled with water. Uh, this, this work was very much inspired by a visit to one of the Delhi Dhaba, uh, Chandigarh Dhabas. Well, it was kind of a restaurant. It, it, this is called the old restaurant gets a new wing. So these are, there's, there's uh, the, the old arch of the, of, 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 of older buildings, older architecture. And then there are these new right, right angles, extensions, and signs of celebration. So another thing which interested me at the time was to play with light, which again continues with my interest in, in, in video and cinematic image. So light here behaves not uh, in the manner that light behaves. There's no one source of light. Uh, these teapots are meant to be sitting on the table, but they're lit up from below uh, in, in, in an impossible way, and there's light underneath where they, they should be shadow. And then there's some flat colors used where there wouldn't be this flatness like behind the, this orange behind the man's beard. And, and, and then and this was, uh, uh, then I actually posed people as well. Uh, so there's another aspect of the theatricality. I made somebody sit on a chair and I took some reference photographs, made some drawings of that. And then there's a man who, behind him who could be uh, taking snuff or probably picking his nose. And then there's the waiter who, 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 who stands with his hand on his waist akimbo and he's scratching his crotch, which is uh, quite a common sight. This is, uh, I think I simply called it rain. I can't quite recall what is the full title, but it was again to do with uh, rejuvenation. There's behind this body, which seems to be, could be a man who is ill or could be a man who is dying or is being revived uh, by this hand uh, of, of, of an androgynous person. And an androgynous person again appears quite a lot in my work. And behind him, what looks like a boat is the top of a turban. And uh, he's carrying a basket of uh, something very fragile. These are like glass bottles and glass jars. And he seems to be standing on the edge of a precipice. And fire, again, is, it also destroys, but also it's it creates. It gives, makes space for something new. And then there is precariously balanced foot on the, on the tightrope, which is not quite tight. I did a series of paintings uh, which I wanted them to combine into one very large painting. Uh, this is simply called Cock-a-doodle-doo. This, uh, this child man, again, this, the, 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 the inner, the third space of ambiguity. Here, uh, this is the child man and that's the androgynous person on the, on, the, on the skateboard. This also forms uh, part of the same uh, set which went into a large painting. 
dreaming hunter. So again, this child man holds a piece of cloth for this matron to cut uh, with, with, with the scissors, and he seems to be a bit terrified. And then there is a, a man who seems to be in admiration of his own beauty, who's riding on the back of a peacock, and the peacock is looking at his reflection in a pool uh, in the clouds. Uh, this was called Family 2. I missed to show Family 1, which is somehow this was related to. That was an early painting. So I was also, I, I did some paintings which, where I, I wondered if it was possible to, to have unabashed frontal nudity and still be able to uh, bring some complexity to a work. where it's not easily read as, as, as erotic or sexual. Uh, this is part of the same set, it's called uh, Of a Teapot and Other Vessels, where there's a woman holding a vessel, which is again a sign of fecundity, whereas the man looks away in the, into the background, well, towards the horizon. Well, this is where all of these came together. Uh, I called it the storyteller. Well, I grew up uh, with, with in the family where everybody was a great storyteller and very individual, both my uncles and my mother, grandmother, and they were all different kinds of storytellers. And so were the people who came to work in the house, who were attached to the house, like the house mason or the house carpenter. Uh, they all were fascinating storytellers. So in fact, some, a, lot of, a lot of these aspects are from, from the stories which I heard, and then I invented some of my own. And we, I, have, I laid these uh, bricks just to remember the, the mason. I did a set of portraits. Uh, This is just called a uh, woman and flying insect. This is another one. Another again, the, uh, the androgynous licking. And also something else which interested me was that there still is a potential in, in, uh, in kitsch, in kind of bizarre art, in the way the colors are used, in kind of calendarish art, that, that there's a possibility of, ki of a kind of sophisticated kitsch where one could bring in a lot of subtleties, but one could use the, uh, uh, a certain kind of, uh, uh, certain kind of power which, which Kitsch does have, a certain kind of, uh, you know, boldness uh, and ability to immediately attract, which, which poster, poster art has, which uh, our Kitsch art has. Yeah, this uh, this is a uh, this is called simply uh, two women with the lizard. Uh, I worked on it for many, many, many years, and I worked with uh, by making very small marks. It's almost like like making a carpet. Uh, it's like a carpet pile. So as light bounces off the of the, of the surface of the of the painting, it acquires a certain glow. Uh, which wouldn't be possible with 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 uh, flat brushwork or with simple brushwork. Here again, there is uh, a kind of drama happening. There's in in a pool of water, we have a table which looks like a dinner table, and these people are having uh, some kind of a quarrel. Uh, part of the tablecloth seems to drift away into the water, and this man. There's one man who walks off and sheds his clothes. This was, again, a small set of uh, works of a, of a different kind. One can't make out very much in this, but this is abstracted. This is a man um, live, living in a tree. He's climbed up on a tree. Uh, 
this was an old story by Tolstoy, uh, which was reworking, I think, of another story where uh, a landed uh, country person, a very rich country person, uh, landed person, landowner, uh, is fed up with, with the amount of wealth he had and how he was treating other people. He decides to climb upon one of the trees on his estate and never comes down. This is a mixed media, small watercolor pastel called Woman Pierced by Moons. I think this is called Rati and Karma. Uh, this is when they were, went through the forest to arouse Shiva from his uh, deep meditation state where the, the world had come to a standstill and everything was turning into desert. But as they both of them went through the forest, trees began to flower and animals began to frolic. I found that image very beautiful. Uh, this man talking to the flamingos comes back again and again, but something which we can't make, it's a very large painting. Uh, there are people who seem to be evacuating their place. They seem to be migrating. Uh, it's called white shadows. We can't see it in the reproduction, but all of them have white shadows. This man with a torch. And this also of men who seem to be in a state of searching or waiting. Uh, and, and the sense of expectation uh, is something uh, which, which has continued to interest me. Because it also then begins to speak of a time of yet to come. So I'm keeping, dealing with time in that. Uh, this, is, uh, this is called the itiner itinerant librarian's dilemma of choice and refusal. Uh, during the, after the 9-11 uh, in America, so uh, I was going to travel to, to England and then to America after that. I was told by my uh, flight agent uh, that I should cut my beard because people are being harassed, those who keep long beard at, uh, at, uh, at airports. But then it got connected with many other things during the anti-Sikh riots in Delhi. There were people who were changing their identity by, by, by cutting off their hair. Again, the androgynous figure, and but further away, uh, we see uh, their tanks rolling in. Again, I'm sorry, uh, in this reproduction, one won't be able to make out, only in the actual painting one can. So they're approaching his, uh, his paradise, which is also could be kind of self-delusional state. This is called Boy Without Reflection. So there are these dogs who have multiple reflections. And there is this man-child again who seems to have unleashed them, and, but he has no reflection. So there is there's also this play on the word reflection to, to be unthinking. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an installation with, with wire sculptures and with paintings. And these are freestanding. These stand on the, on the, on the floor. And uh, uh, so the middle painting is hidden by partially, uh, hidden by uh, two paintings on the sides. And so uh, the one which is closest to us is one uh, on our left. Uh, and then there's one in the middle and one on the right side. Here too, uh, it's called Reading Man, and there are wire sculptures of people reading, which works like almost like a drawing uh, in the air. There's a man sitting in a chair on the left, reading a book. One is reclining in the middle, reading a book, and one standing up, reading a book. But here too, it's it's again my interest in the uh, in in the cinematic and unfolding of time is when you actually have to walk from one point to another. So, uh, because then the slightly the hidden part gets revealed as well. And uh, so there isn't a scanning of the work from, from a standing point. This was a, a, a pencil drawing. 
with some charcoal and some crayon. Uh, this is, there's an artist with a roll of paper standing on this edge looking onto the other side of the city. And, and these are behind him are the things he carries, his memories, his experience, but also uh, the art history that all artists carry with them. And probably there's his muse up in the tree. I do love donkeys very much. This is just a, a, an emaciated donkey under a tree, a watercolor, being offered flowers by an angel. Uh, can't, there's two wrestlers in a forest here. And this, the wrestlers come again and again in my work too, which we'll eventually see in the video work. Uh, I thought it would take too long if I was to show one each of these. And so I've done a set of, these are not miniatures, but I could say inspired by miniatures, uh, but, but, but uh, not you know, technically following what miniatures are, uh, but taking something from the history of, 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 of miniatures. And, uh, uh, and then I framed them in, in, in a modernist manner. So, uh, and this is packing material on which I have then uh, worked, made, made some uh, designs and shapes which are again modernist. So it's like packaging an old tradition into, uh, you know, uh, in, in some contemporary manner. It's slightly tongue in cheek, everything. Uh, this is also, also where women wrestling with men and where all the women are in a winning position. There's also a little thing on the Punjabi man saying Mard Shair, you know, but they're defeated by these women every time. This is a sculpture. Uh, it's called Ouroboros. Ouroboros is, um, is this ancient symbol of serpent swallowing its own tail. So this, this man on the horse lights up his flash torch to, to light up his path, but all he manages to do is light the back of his own horse. Uh, so I made the sculpture, then split it up and put the back of the horse in front of him. And uh, uh, this little girl is there, she's just digitally put there just to uh, uh, give a sense of scale. So this is a large sculpture. Uh, she's not part of the sculpture. And, but this person could also be looking at his, his, his scattered self to put himself together again, uh, which, because of the shape of the pedestals, is, is an impossibility. And uh, the, 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 the man's body merges with that of the horse, uh, which is also to say that this is not the sculpture of a horse and this is not the sculpture of a man. But I'm just using these devices to make meaning. Uh, this is a proposed sculpture. I have not made it. I have just digitally produced this image. Uh, instead of two donkeys, there may be one. So this, the donkey will be perforated, and there will be streams of water, water flowing through his body. And uh, that's... Uh, uh, an itinerant salesman of fluorescent tube lights who falls on his knees as he sees this man. You know, I've, one of the many reasons why I love donkeys is how they have built civilizations and how they continue to be butt of jokes and also not very well looked after. Uh, they're digital photographs, so what I do is uh, I make people, I stage them in a certain way, create again this theatricality that I've been interested in, photograph them. And so the man with the spinning toy comes back again. This is just called family photos, family pictures. So it's family picture one and there'll be family picture two. Uh, these are then printed on, these are quite large, like the man would be life size. Um, and I print them on canvas and then Part, then I paint part, parts of the canvas. And I paint them for the reason that light bounces off differently uh, from these uh, archival links. And it bounces off differently from the oil paints where I painted in oil. And so it cre creates a, a very interesting dynamic between the two. 
and gives, energizes the surface uh, in interesting ways. These family pictures too. Uh, because of this light, it's, the colors, it's getting slightly washed out, but not too bad. This is, um, I was passing in a car uh, through some old town and saw this courtyard while passing through. I'd taken a photograph. So I thought of uh, inventing a little story for the courtyard. So that's my mother's sewing machine I put over there. It's called uh, Line and a Milk Bowl. And there are some pieces strewn around. And uh, there is a woman at the far end who is holding a bowl of milk in her hand. So we don't know whether she's trying to pacify the line or, uh, you know, she's, she's uh, beckoned the line to come. And then there are these uh, people who seem to be half wrestling, who seem to be in a state of turmoil, who are uh, who seem to have all clambered up. And this also then makes reference to art history and so on. Uh, this uh, was made as a light box, but I've also printed it on canvas and uh, uh, worked on it. During the Commonwealth Games, uh, artists were invited to, to make paintings which would uh, refer to Delhi or refer to the games. Uh, so uh, what, what we were expected to do was to make laudatory work, appreciating the work, but we know what ac actually transpired. Um, so I call it Conference of Birds and Beasts. Uh, this is also in, in, in obliquely refers to uh, an old ancient Persian poem called Con Conference of uh, Birds, where uh, uh, birds go in search of their leader, or ser search, searching for the master, searching of somebody who would reveal the truth to them. And they are led by a hoopoe, and uh, they're finally, after a long journey, are led to a lake, and in the lake they see their own reflection. So then they are told, you yourself are the master of your lives. So, it is, so, so this was also to speak of the need for introspection. And then on the right side, far away, we see the Tower of Babel, uh, which, which was again uh, to speak of this immense hubris uh, which uh, the officials uh, carried in, in organizing these games that will make the finest and we will make the biggest of games and infrastructure for the games and what a sham it was. <coughs> this, this, this was made like when I say constructed photograph. This is made with over, over 300 layers. Of, of images. Uh, th this is uh, called Contested Desires, uh, a set of two works. This is one, this is another. So uh, these, these people seem to be standing on the edge of, uh, there's a highway on the, on the far side. This is a large work, so one can actually see detail of uh, the, the hive and so on. And now here you can see a bit more clearly the painted parts. Some of their clothes are painted, the sky is painted, some of the migrating birds are painted, the, uh, some of the dead birds on the ground are painted, some of these little heaps are painted as well. So this could be like an anticipation. This is again state of the, of the immigrant or, 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 or the migrant. Like here too, they seem to be either running away from somebody or they are trying to enter a space they're not allowed to enter, or it could be just some games that adults play. Yeah. I recently had a show in Bombay, and it was in Mumbai, and it was uh, documented. 
it's kind of a rough cut, uh, but we can see a short documentation of it. Uh, well, this is, again, you know, I was thinking there'll be students here, uh, also to speak a little about the nature of installation itself. Uh, you know, this, this is one piece, one uh, called crossings. Uh, so my preferred way to install it was that uh, uh, they'll be, they'll all sit in a row. They're about 40 feet uh, wide wall, or a 40 feet wide wall. So th this is again, these are projections on paintings. Uh, but where from time to time the video image moves out of its painted self and the shell of the painting stays behind. And for instance, it stops breathing. Of course, breath is provided by the video. And then they visit other paintings. And after that, they come back to inhabit their painted selves. Now, this was, so when you take such a work to a different space, uh, that space may not have 40 feet uh, of running wall. And, and then, you, then you improvise. So this is what I would like to say to young artists. It's very important not to stick to one thing that to, or to stay rigid with it, but to make the best of what's available. And, and you then begin to see surprising results. This worked well. And then another space, uh, this is at the Mori Museum in Tokyo. They didn't have such a large wall, but the largest space they had uh, was with a very high ceiling, was where this could, have be, this could be curved. So they just raised it up and curved it into a semicircle. Again, it worked very well. Uh, this is a video proje projection on, on uh, Again, I can call it a video sculpture um, on, on a theater on wheels, one can say, or cinema on wheels, or video on wheels. Uh, this is a device which can collapse into something which is very portable, and or it, uh, it opens up to form kind of a cart, and you can push it. And then the top bit is two windows. And uh, that's where the film projection takes place. Here it was, both, uh, uh, here it was shown in a tent. It's like a circus tent uh, where the same cart uh, or the video on wheels is uh, wheeled inside this space. Uh, here there's an installation where uh, there was a large body of water, but I think 15 feet wide, again 30 feet deep. And uh, I made a sculptural shape of a, of a hill or a mountain, and, and uh, there was a projection on top of that, uh, which, which sometimes changed into kind of a cave and so on, but to build a kind of open-ended narrative. And the background was another projection of city traffic which is reflected in the water. Uh, this this uh, has been projected in many different ways, but this one of the ways is here where it's a board with, uh, which is suspended from the ceiling and is projected from both the sides. And, but it's hung in a manner where you don't see how it's suspended. So it looks like a floating mirror. And as you walk around it, uh, it, it acquires a certain lightness. And it helps conceptually the meaning of the work as well. Uh, other times, it's been projected on uh, plexiglass, which has been sanded. And then what happens? Because plexiglass allows some, only some of the light to be reflected back. So it seems as if the image is trapped inside this plexiglass. And then the grain of the plexiglass scatters light. So even if it's a black and white video, it suddenly begins to have little pockets of color. It was also uh, then once shown uh, in a little alcove, just about this size, built into a wall. And it, was, it, it had back projection. 
and then it looked like a little space for worship. And it again worked like an icon very well because the sides of the wall of the alcove were lit up uh, by this light. Uh, this is uh, another piece. Um, it, 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 it was um, um, it was more for 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 some uh, cultural studies. So this was to show the progression of music, but in Punjab. But but this is or development of music in Punjab. But this. Uh, would, would take some time to talk about. This is a work which is still in the making. It's called Forest. And uh, here I've made kind of a shelf representing knowledge in, in, in the forest. And the whole events which happen around this and this line is the guardian of this knowledge. So, yeah, this is it. So this was just to show different ways of uh, uh, installing work. Now we will see a short video. So uh, there were paintings. There were paintings on the left and right, and the middle is just the wall. And uh, how I wanted to show it, where you break the plaster of the wall and break it down to its brick, and the and the brick is burnt or um, it's uh, it's fractured in some ways. Uh, it, then it creates kind of a veil, but also a surface that 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 has been worked on suddenly creates a sense of time. Yes, this, this, the element of time is introduced which, into the medium itself, into the materiality of the work itself, uh, which will not happen if it was projected on, say, a flat white screen. Uh, yes, this, so these two people, some of you may have seen this work in Delhi uh, at, the, at the art fair. So, People on the left and right eat all the time, and then they go to the middle to wrestle. And as they wrestle, they, they transform as well. They take on different personas, sometimes changing gender uh, or cha changing their uh, class identity. So if, if one was to just simplify it, we can say that food is metaphor for life, and wrestling is how we deal with these questions of life. This is a little detail of the painted part.
It's just this, this dripping of water in the pan behind him, which is like beating of time. And as he strikes the air in front of him, uh, before the horse appears, it's kind of sound of a conch shell uh, combined with uh, kind of a beating of a drum uh, and bit of sound of the hammer striking metal. You can see this little white streak on the right side is uh, uh, are the water drops. So and and each water drop has a different note. Uh, this work too has been shown in various ways. Uh, the first time it was shown, it was shown in the 45, 45 feet long wall. So there's a train that passes by and the train is actual life size. So that is a very different feel to it. Yeah, in my hometown, uh, from the rooftop, I could see a, a tiny little train station. And usually, uh, we would see people hurriedly getting off, a small group of people who were probably migrants. All these are projections on paintings. Now, uh, how I began to project and why I began to project uh, video onto painting is uh, that painting has, like with all of us painters, painting has interested me hugely to look at painting and also questions like what is it in uh, when you're confronting a great painting, when you're with an actual painting, the experience you have and how different it is from when you look even a great reproduction done to scale. Uh, so it is the physicality of, of the painting and how you are always addressing a reproduction, but a painting begins to at a certain time speak to you. So, so it begins to say something from the other side. And I think that has something to do with the, with the skin of the painting, with the, with its, uh, with its, which is to do with its gravity, with its body that it carries. So that interests 
interested me very much. And then there is the image of image that's made of light. Uh, that's a cinematic image, image uh, made of uh, cinematic image made of light, which which has a different aura of a presence. You can't hold it, but it but it does create some beautiful depth and some great sense of presence. So I wondered what would happen if I combined both. And, and I found that, yes, a kind of, I could arrive at kind of a third thing, which was neither painting and nor was it uh, video. So then it spoke to you differently. And when something speaks to you differently, then it allows you to enter different experiences and to speak of those spaces which you wouldn't be able to otherwise enter. And then there was the aspect of there is time. Time lives in a painting in a different way. And there is the notion of cinematic time, which is different. So I could play with these two things as well. And uh, another technical level, the, in, in, in a cinematic image, Black is just the absence of light on a white surface. Our eyes only, in relation to other tones, begins to believe it's black. But here I could have actual black. Uh, I could, because I could just paint it black. And if I was to paint light, I could paint light, but I could also have actual light. So, so the tonal range which I could play with was quite phenomenal. And, uh, then you can absorb light in certain areas. You can make light bend in certain areas by the way you use pigment, by making it, uh, get, uh, allowing it to get absorbed. And you can sharpen edges. And then it, it changes color. You can alter the, the cinematic color, the video color, by the color on the painting. And, the, and vice versa. The, the video light changes light on the painting, uh, color on the painting. And then if you form some thin layers of paint uh, where light travels through those thin layers then bounces back from the white surface underneath. Then it looks like stained glass window because then loud light is coming from the other side. So uh, there, there's so much to play with and I continue to explore it. Uh, and also taking it into another dimension of, uh, of, of sculpture with which, which I'm presently engaged in doing. Uh, these are uh, the last two works which we have outside, so we need not view them. I don't know how you feel. If you want to view them, you can. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, because these, these are works which are outside. Well, all right, they're not very long. Maybe two minutes, three minutes long. And also, I have installed my earlier work, some later work as well, on, on easels. So, so conceptually, they make a certain meaning for me. It's uh, at one level, almost a crass level, I, <laughs> possibly, I don't know. It's also like saying it's the aspiration of, with new, with, with, with new media, it's almost like painting wanting to come out of its frame, or wanting to breathe, wanting to move. Um, and then, but at another level, it's just acknowledging where it's all coming from, because I'm, I'm not a filmmaker, and I don't see myself as such. I see uh, a video camera, and I see how I can use this tool. Uh, and I don't, although I, and I do love cinema very much, of course, but it's, I'm not, I've not studied cinema. Uh, So, uh, so this is, uh, this is just picking up whatever is around you. And as was, we were having a conversation earlier, that what's uh, again w wonderful today is to to be able to do away with hierarchies, so that the oil on canvas comes on the top, then something comes below that, and drawing has another status. 
this is that artists just find any tune around them, be it a camera, a spray camera, whatever, uh, or a little pile of bricks which they make into a shape. Uh, they, they have moved out of just being uh, uh, a photographer or a, or, a, or, a, or a painter or a watercolorist. Uh, and also this has allowed one to see photography as art. But that wasn't seen as art. It was sort of seen as lesser of, of an art. But now it's, you know, like museums weren't acquiring it. Those, but now museums where the fine art is shown, they're acquiring photographs. So, uh, so that, that's, quite, that's quite wonderful. So it's acknowledging all that as well at the same time. And then in some of these, uh, as you saw in the kettle one as well, where you see a hand which comes and blocks the video light. So uh, a lot of, when I initially showed this work, it used to perturb me initially that everybody wants to s sort of stop it and see as to what it is behind it. And then, I th well, I said, you know, I will introduce the hand myself. One doesn't have to go to the trouble of putting the hand to block the light, but it's also, in a way, like in this work particularly, which is outside as well, in the, in the end, I deliberately take away depth created by the cinem cinematic light, and I flatten the work uh, with flat shadows falling on top. But this again is to say that this is just an artifact. Yeah, I think it's going to end with this. Yeah, where it gets flattened and the shadows begin to fall on top. He was a good man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What a chance. There, we're going to end it here. <laughs> Sorry if it was longish. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've seen, he's a very, very special painter, special person, transporting us, God knows from where to where. You can all imagine, according to your own imagination. But he has a very, very fine eye for detail, and he's, he's a, a freak. Like even a millimeter of registrations, you know, uh, moving this way or that way from his painting, he would not uh, kind of accept it. Yeah. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here and to be able to show my work. Yeah. We have uh, produced memorabilia items uh, of, of some of the works of uh, Ranbir Kaleka in, as neckties and mugs and you know, coasters and some other, other things. And you are very welcome to buy those. They're very reasonably priced. And now Academy has built a whole collection of, uh, you know, memorabilia, be it uh, Jatinda, Sanjali, Ela Menon, uh, Shakti Barman, uh, of the, those great artists who have really agreed. And Goswami's poems are very special. Uh, you can, you can uh, support the Academy by buying those, by spreading the word and spreading the images amongst the younger generation. I would request Professor Goswami to share, yeah. uh, maybe a couplet. You must be having. But there's something, be... something I wanted to sh say before that. Yeah. That sure. uh, Dr. Sub was one of the first people to write on my work when I was a student. <laughs> right. So that's I feel very very special. I'll, I will not forget it. So how you encouraged me then, so many many years ago, 70s. <laughs> yes. 
I'm very sorry this turning into an imposition each time that somebody speaks here, somebody of the distinction of Ranbir Kalika. But since he was kind enough to mention this, may I also recall that occasion. When he was a student here at the College of Art, I was writing a column for the newspaper at those particular times, and I happened to see some photographs of his taken in the corridors of the hostel of the College of Art. And I was so struck by them. I really felt that somebody had a very, very special and a very keen eye. And then soon after that, there was an exhibition in the College of Art here where there was a large painting by him. And he was he's still young, but he was younger then. So he sidled up to me um, and naturally wanted to hear as to what I thought about the painting, so if, if I had any thoughts. And I remember having made a remark to him. I said, I think it is too cluttered. I have traveled a long distance from that time to now. And I think it was not his painting which was cluttered, but my mind which was cluttered with all kinds of things. He was seeing things with clarity. And I was seeing them as a kind of a jumble of things. Ranbir has traveled a long, long distance. And I am in admiration of the work that he has done, is continuing to do. Um, two thoughts come to my mind, two images as I sit here, when I was sitting and watching him speak. As the lecture was drawing to a close, two gentlemen walked in here. It, the room was dark. One of them was wearing, uh, he's still there, I'm sure, he's shifted his place, uh, a red t-shirt uh, with a loosely tied scarf around his neck. And the other gentleman, who's wearing a striped t-shirt, walked up here and they stood here in this particular corner. My eye traveled in that direction. And I suddenly took that little frame in. The two gentlemen there, this more or less broken air conditioner in the background, certainly a broken light standing next to it. <clears throat> the old table and a kind of a, an image of a, of a flower bouquet. And suddenly it looked like a Dranbir Kaleka painting to me. <laughs> I, I was quite struck by that. Yes. As if suddenly, you know, you see things differently. And that is the magic of that, for me, is the magic of art. It allows us to see things differently. It impels us to see things differently. It persuades us, cajoles us, commands us to do these things in a very, very different fashion. The second image, when I was sitting here and, and looking at uh, Ranbir as he was speaking, there he was speaking with his felt hat in the image in front, the computer in front of him. And there was his shadow on the wall. The shadow was longer. And for a moment I was, thought I was hallucinating. Is that real Ranbir or is this real Ranbir? Or is this one of his studio, one of his um, installations in which he has jumped up from this particular place to that particular place and so on and become a different person altogether and then suddenly my eye would travel and he was sitting here. No, 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 he's fixed there, he's right there and so on. This is what works of art and their interpretation can do. I might have been hallucinating, but if art yields you an experience and it is useless if it does not yield you a different experience, then this is what it is all about. He is expanding like many artists of his own generation, not only in this particular town, this particular country, but all over the world who are expanding the horizons of art and who are in a certain sense making us far more aware than we are of our environment, of the things we miss to see, of the magic that is there in this particular world and so on. 
होता है शब रूस तमाशा मेरे आगे थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू थैंक यू